the process of betrayal, but the number of the number of actions in this period from you know the interwar period right up and right up into the 1950s if i was to describe the actions of the british elite as anything it would just be traitorous they're just it is just outright treason as far as i can see none of their actions make any sense whatsoever um from the point of view of british prestige british power british interest i mean it's just a nonsense all of these what about from the perspective of finances I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, well. I mean, I mean, Semigog. I I don't see uh, again. I, I I hate to bring this point up, but regarding central authority and imperial figurehead and the centrifugalism and the, you can say the timing of the British Empire in the sense that it was doomed due to the entire construct of which it was built, um, the foundations of which it was built. R regarding finance, if a say, for example, the Jews wanted Britain to stand up to Hitler, and of course there is a major component to that driving British policy, Churchill's own policy, and U.S. policy towards this. British policy in the 1930s makes no sense if you take that in the perspective. It is wholly un incompetent and inconsistent, not just in the case of um, uh, the relationship to Germany, but the whole policy of appeasement in general. And I, I like the fact, A, you brought up the uh, Montague Chelmsford report. Um, it's the creation of diarchy, which is the idea of Indian responsible government. And this is actually compounded by the Simon report. The whole premise of the diarchy is that the government will continually review the situation in India. Essentially, there is a basis for increased progressivism in the state of India. And the Simon Report actually provides the entire ideological and political bedrock for Indian independence 12 years later, which is rapidly increase as a result of the process of the Second World War. So that really needs to be illustrated. The mobilization of the Indian National Congress, the Indian National Congress that needs to be pointed out was a essentially a, a British adventure from the begin from the beginning. It was founded by a British, um, uh, I don't know how to describe it, Indianophile. Um, and of course it became a Anglicized liberal Indian elite movement from there. And the franchise, as you mentioned, AA was very small. And of course, this was actually in stark contrast to the entire Indian alliance system, which you can see on this map, which was predicated around the British allying with Indian aristocratic elites, the so-called Raja states. So that's very important to bring up in terms of the British, not only creating a situation in which the Indian Empire would secede, but creating a situation in like the Doctrine of Lapse that precedes the Sepoy Rebellion or the Indian Mutiny of 1858, the British have created a situation in which they are going to betray their very allies who have helped propped up the Raj. <laughs> so just to, to, to really compound all the points you bring there. And of course, the effect of the First World War, uh, Semiagog, in terms of all the investment and the financial motivations and the British spies, all this is simply to compound that it was completely in vain in terms of the perpetuation of the British Empire and in service of something else, which is very clear here, because the British Empire, as a result of World War One, rather than consolidating, rather than universal conscription being seen as a tool for imperial unification, is a tool of imperial disintegration. And the case, obviously, with Anzac nationalism, the, the memory of Gallipoli in terms of the national story, you can almost say the first national story of Australia, and of course, what we see in the creation of India. But in terms of coming back to 1930s and the idea of the British elite being almost seen as outright traitorous, which I agree with you. And this also actually pertains to the U uh, UK policy towards the Soviet Union, which has been created this time. Lloyd George accelerates the process of recognition of the Soviet Union. Um, they are allowed in under the Labour government. You have aspects such as the Zinoviev letter, which uh, sub subsequently have been denounced supposedly as fake, but there is definitely a pro-Soviet contingent in that government. And of course, the Soviets bring over spies and the Conservative the government under Stanley Baldwin and expels them all again. But regarding the policy of the 1930s, the British did everything in their power to alienate their natural allies. They alienated the Japanese over their League of Nations stance over Manchuria. And again, as I mentioned before, the Manchurian question had been the motivation for attacking Russia in the first place and allowing Britain to defeat 
Russia by proxy. Now Britain has betrayed Japan twice over the Anglo-American Naval Treaty and over the issue of Manchuria. And again, the fundamental contradiction which puts a time limit on the success of the British Empire is the fact that the League of Nations is essentially proposing the idea of self-determination. Chinese are allowed self-determination, Manchurians are allowed self-determination vis-a-vis Japanese expansion, but no one else in the British Empire is. So this, again, in terms of a fundamental contradiction, appears like a farce. In terms of Mussolini and his alienation from the British alliance project, we see the annexation of Abyssinia. The Abyssinian war is basically a litmus test for Britain's ability to countenance a imperial aggressor because, of course, Italy had tried to invade Ethiopia in the 1890s. They've been humiliated. They succeed in the 1930s. But what Britain does is drive Italy away from their own sphere of influence and into the camp of the Germans. Italy, just for a bit of context at this time, had been responsible partly for renting German access to Austria and completing the process of Anschluss. Really, you can say that Mussolini's direct turn in 1938, as with the Japanese turn towards invading the Chinese in 1937, is all a result of British incompetence. And regarding appeasement, Churchill, you can say, actually, to give him a bit of slack, if Britain was going to go to war against Germany in 1939, Churchill, as we saw in 1914, was a consistent war hawk against Germany to the point of madness in terms of the mitigation, the defeat of so-called Prussian militarism, which is a consistent theme in in Churchill's mind, uh, his worldview. Regarding appeasement, it seems completely contrary to British interests if the ultimate design of the American empire, of the United States to get involved in a conflict, uh, is to go to war against Germany in 1939 after having allowed Hitler to consolidate um, both the army and both his uh, economic position and his territorial position, where basically Poland could be wiped out from both sides as a result of the Nazi-Soviet pact. Um, Another point to consider, which is lost in terms of the whole concept of appeasement, is the complete apathy of the British Empire in terms of defending its own interests, where really the whole notion of a British Empire, which is self-interested, again, coming back AA to this idea of tre- of treason, is that the British Empire accepts a process of decline. We see this first in China, where the British are conceding their various territorial concessions, where Britain is taking a back seat regarding their economic full spectrum control in the 1890s as per the Imperial Maritime Customs Service. And in Ireland, this is the most extreme process, and I would say a foreshadowing of the dissolution of the Dominion. Because first of all, in 1922, Ireland was created as the Irish Free State. We have the war in Ireland. This completely confounds the idea of unionism, which is now limited to what is now Northern Ireland. In the 1930s, Eamon de Valera came back into power through his new outfit, Fianna Foyle, which replaced in part Sinn Féin, albeit Sinn Féin continued. And he began a deliberate process towards the creation of an Irish Republic. The British did virtually nothing to stop it. And by the 1930s, Ireland was essentially independent in all but name. The king only had a tangential link. And during World War II, this was confirmed by strict Irish neutrality. After World War II, Canada begins opting for independence from 1946. In terms of that portrayal, AA, that you mentioned regarding the 13 years under a conservative government, under Churchill, under Eden, under Macmillan, Where is the Winds of Change speech delivered? In Cape Town? Yeah. In in a complete sort of um, contravention of the then ruling elite who were up until that point aligned with the British Empire. So not only do they basically opt out of the Commonwealth project at that point, but they also disband their connection to the monarchy and proclaim themselves a republic in full repudiation of the winds of change. So as we see with India and as we see with the Boers, it seems that British policy after World War I is a deliberate alienation of their allies. One of the most bizarre things about this, as told by Major General Richard Hilton, who was a kind of, you know, hardcore imperial loyalist, you know, British Empire, kind of a almost you could say Colonel Blimp character if you want. Um, he he is just completely befuddled by, I mean, in today's terms, but, I mean, and the list is huge, by the way, you know, India, Pakistan, Myanmar, Ceylon, Ghana, Malaya, 
which is Somaliland, Cyprus, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, South Africa, South Cameroons, Jamaica, Trinidad and Tobago, Uganda, you know, Zanzibar, Malaysia, Kenya, Malta. I mean, it's just insane. Rhodesia, all of these places uh, during, during this time. But the way he describes it, I think in today's terms, it's almost like a kind of series of color revolutions supported by left-wing intellectuals in England, even in places where they didn't particularly want it. And I mean, there, there are a few cases where it was violent, but as, as Hilton points out, it's like the British army could have smashed any of those places if they'd wanted to during that time. It's not like, you know, Britain didn't have a, an army and couldn't, I mean, you know, they just refused to put them down because they had this idea in Hilton's terms. He says, majority rule has been elevated by left-wing propaganda to the status of a sacred religious fetish to which even such an eminent Christian divine as the Archbishop of Canterbury bows down. Um, and what, what does that what does that remind you of? Yeah, I mean, and what his, his what his point is is that in all of these places, like there was no particular will on the part of the pub of the publics of these countries or the subjects of these countries to want independence or like, there was no like popular support for any of these things. It was merely just kind of exactly like you see color revolutions in countries now, uh, you know, pushed by the pushed by the uh, what we call the gay. But the most bizarre thing is, is that these are, you know, countries declaring independence, becoming nations in their own right, and, you know, uh, you know, leaving the British Empire, aided and abetted by British elites. It's, it's really one of the most bizarre things um, that, uh, I mean, I, I don't know what accounts for it, to be honest. I, I still don't know. 